Would you please pray with me? Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh, you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Do any of you remember playing the game King of the Hill when you were kids? Anybody? Or maybe some of you called it King of the Mountain or King of the Castle. Well, I do too. And regardless of what it's called, the object of the game remains the same. The child on top of the hill or the pile or whatever you're playing it on at the time is the king, right? And the other kids, well, they try to push or knock the king off. And of course, the king pushes back. So whoever succeeds in pushing the king off the hill becomes the new king for a little while until she or he gets pushed off by somebody else. And while I remember playing King of the Hill when I was a kid, I don't really remember thinking very much about it. Well, other than that, it was mostly fun. And I say mostly fun because it was only fun and still, until someone took it a little too seriously and got a little too rough. And sometimes that would be the king who just didn't want to give up his or her spot on the hill. Or other times it was one or the more of the other kids who were trying to push the king off the hill. And either way, you know, we would start to tackle them or punch them or kick them. And, you know, we would no longer treat each other humanely. And so the game would quickly end. And that's probably because it was no longer a game. Well, I didn't think about it much when I was a kid, but King of the Hill is really a game about power. Who has it? Who thinks they have it? And who wants it? The game is set up so that the king appears to have the most power. After all, every kid wants to be the king, right? Because the king is at the top of the hill. And the king can see the others coming. The king can dodge out of the way or mount a really good defense. In other words, the king has power over the other kids. But the other kids have power too because they have the ability to push the king off the hill. Yet the kids don't often see their power as being the same as the king's. Now, I remember those times when a group of us would gang up on a particularly tenacious king that none of us could topple by ourselves, and we would combine our physical and intellectual power to push the king off the hill, and then we would stand victoriously on top together. Of course, only for a little while, until we started to fight amongst ourselves about who should be the one and only king of the hill. Because each of us wanted that sovereign power all for ourselves, if only for a fleeting moment. So this simple child's game of king of the hill is really more than a game. It shows us the complexity of power dynamics, what we think power is, and how power shifts among people and groups. And really, I think our lives as adults are not so different than when we played King of the Hill because the ways in which we gain power, use our power, and view our power are very complicated. So very often, we're not clear about our own power or the power of others. For instance, from the time we're very young, we're taught that in order to be successful, we need to climb the corporate ladder. We need to rise above others and to manage people and have power over them. In other words, we're basically taught that we need to be king of the hill. The higher you go, the more power you have. Yet even though many of us have positions of power at work, we feel like we have very little power in our own lives. It seems like we are driven by forces beyond our control and that we work just to survive, just to keep ourselves in our houses and to keep the food on our table. So we feel like we have few choices. And the systems that exist in our world and our nation are so huge and often so anonymous that we think we cannot affect change at all. So we feel like we're stuck living in a system where we have very little power. Because of this, we either don't realize we have power or we take for granted the power we have. Yet whether we realize it or not, every day the majority of us here in this room wield a great deal of power. Our socioeconomic status, our education, our skin color and our ethnicity, our gender, our sexual preference, and even our religious beliefs give us privilege and power in our daily lives. Power to decide where we live, 
what types of jobs we apply for, how and where we worship, where we can socialize, and what we buy. Many of us make choices about these things every day without ever even thinking about it. So like in the, the kids in the game who rush up the hill at the king, we have power. We just don't feel like we have as much power as we really do. Power itself is not bad. Power is simply the ability to act. So every person has some power, even if it's just a little. It's how we view and use our power that matters. Our power is not meant to be power over. It's meant to be power with, with creation and with one another. Yet from the very beginning, we have struggled with power dynamics. We walked with God in the garden and tended and cared for it so that it would sustain us and all of creation, but that wasn't enough. We wanted more. The story in Genesis tells us that Adam and Eve wanted knowledge. And you know the saying, knowledge is power. They believed that the knowledge of good and evil would give them power like God's, and it did, sort of. Human power ended up being power to inflict pain, power to disenfranchise, and power to decimate. Human power was power over, not power with. We see this when after being enslaved for generations in Egypt and for wandering in the desert for 40 years, the Israelites acted like everyone else around them in Palestine by eradicating and enslaving other nations of people in the land of Canaan, their promised land. Yet afterwards, they still wanted someone to have power over them. So they asked the prophet Samuel for a king because they thought it would be easier and things would run more smoothly. But through Samuel, God warned them that a king would only take advantage of them. Human kings would conscript their children to fight wars, take the best of their crops and livestock for himself and his court, and work them so hard that they would feel enslaved to him. Yet the people still wanted a king, and they got one. We struggle with these same power dynamics today. Like the Israelites, we want someone to take care of big things. And really, we need someone to take care of the big things, to organize certain things in our world so that we can go about living our daily lives. Imagine not having an organized system of roads and people who care for them, or a power grid that brings electricity to wherever we need it, or our public schools and teachers who educate our children. So we willingly give each other, give others power over us, like governments and corporations, because we believe that they have our best interests at heart. Unfortunately, though, those in power often take advantage of their power, and we end up feeling like we have no power. Today's passage in Jeremiah reminds us that human power alone is not wise enough, good enough, or strong enough. In this passage, God is really angry with Israel's leaders, or shepherds as they're called in the passage, for not listening to God. The people are in exile. They're scattered because those in their society who are on the margins, like the poor, the widowed, the orphaned, and the sick, are not being cared for. And so society fell apart. This story reminds us that humans almost always gravitate towards power over rather than power with. Like kids playing king of the hill, we would rather be at the top by ourselves than share it with others. So there is always someone left out, and there's always someone on the margins. But in today's story, God promises to raise up a leader who will reign as king, and if we know that people, we know that person to be Jesus. He reminds us that humans need a God to understand power. We need God to guide our ability to act. Jesus is God's living example of how we are to use our power with others. Jesus used his power to help others, to heal, to feed, and to teach, rather than to get himself ahead and to amass wealth. He ate simple meals with outcasts and made sure that everyone with him had enough food. And Jesus also reminded those on the margins that they actually still had power, that they could still make choices about how they acted, what they believed, and who they aligned themselves with. And that's why Jesus was such a threat to those in power. 
because he showed people that true power is power with, not power over. Today, all of us here can use our power with others rather than use it over others. As many of you know, we are on the cusp of the biggest shopping day or days of the year. Did you all hear that people started camping outside of a Best Buy store in Akron, Ohio this last Tuesday? And the news report I saw said that they didn't even know or they didn't tell us in the news report what specifically they were waiting to buy. They're just camped out to buy something. On top of this, more and more stores are opening on Thanksgiving Day, depriving those who have to work there to support themselves. The time the rest of us get to celebrate with our friends, our families, and our loved ones. Or you may have also heard that a Walmart in Canton, Ohio has a food drive every year so that its employees are able to actually have Thanksgiving dinner. And honestly, this is awesome. This has been happening for years, and it just sort of now hit the news. And it's awesome because it's Walmart employees and community members caring for people within their community. And yet, it's really sad that it's even necessary, considering that the six Walmart heirs have more wealth than 42% of Americans. But this holiday season, right now today, we can use our power to support and stand with those who want to work to support themselves and their families. We can buy fair trade products, like the ones at our alternative gift fair that's going to be in the gym right after this. These products are grown and made by people here and around the world who are paid a fair and livable wage for their work. We can also resist the urge to shop on Thanksgiving Day, camp out overnight, or wait in long lines to buy the latest, greatest electronic device at the cheapest price. And we can shop at stores like Costco that we know pay their employees livable wages and benefits. And we can continue to work for living wages for everyone in this country because regardless of what we're told, there's no reason why six people need more wealth or have even earned more wealth than 42% of us. Because contrary to what we've been taught, life's not about being king of the hill. It's not really even about having a hill. Life is about acting with God to make sure that everyone has enough and that everyone is loved and cared for. It's about using our power as power with, not power over each other. Amen. <laughs>